We must cast our minds back many years to find video games that avoid death. Since the first popularization of the first person shooter, death has been everywhere. More specifically, murder is everywhere. Murder that's rewarded with opportunities for more murder with bigger, more murdery weapons. Oh, murder, murder, murder. Change the fucking record! As technology improves, death and violence are only displayed with grander, more impressive realism. Parents of the early 80s who believed video games would breed a generation of depraved, homicidal monsters would no doubt cower at the capabilities of NVIDIA Phys X and dynamic ray tracing, horrified of the way the light catches perfectly off each droplet of blood that spews from enemy jugulars. Fortunately, of the two big stereotypes of that time, the latter prevail. Us gamer boys and gamer girls are too introverted to actually draw back the curtains, leave our mother's basements and rip someone's head off, spine intact. We may not seek out to replicate murder, which, you know, good job by, by us, everyone, keep it up, but we are desensitized to death, at least in, in games. The Kilimanjaro medal doesn't account for the seven family home lives I just ruined. A couple Call of Duty campaigns might question the morality of war and its psychological impact on soldiers, but those games also include a multiplayer mode where if you get a high enough kill streak, you can set the dogs on people. Good day, Smithers release the hounds. What I mean to say is death as a theme has remained the same in games over the past 40 years. Until recently, Spiritfarer is a game about dying, as the tagline states, but this is death as you've never played it before. Played being the operative word, as while Spiritfarer's dialogue spins an emotive tale about learning to say goodbye, it's the mechanics that really intrigue. It's life and farm management loop, a support system for dealing with loss. Speaking of support systems, hi, this is my YouTube channel. <laughs> Have you subscribed? <laughs> for those that are new to this channel, um, I break down a lot of video game narratives um, and not just the, the plot and the story, but the decisions development teams made to tell those stories and why this story is in a game instead of, you know, a book or a film. So yeah, if you if you like that kind of thing or think you might, please consider subscribing. I'm just getting started out, so any support you could give at this stage would be hugely appreciated. Um, but yeah, back to why you're here. Let's break down Spiritfarer's story. Upon waking, Stella, the bright and colourful girl in front of you, meets Karen, not that kind of Karen, but the spirit fairer, the big rumbling thing in front of you. If your Greek mythology is up to snuff, you may know that Charon is an angel of death who ferries souls of the deceased into the afterlife, a job that sounds like an eternal undertaking, but turns out today is his last day. It's time for him to pass the mantle of spirit fairer over to Stella. It is now your duty to sail the seas, collect lost spirits, and fulfill their requests so they may leave through the Everdor and drift toward whatever lies beyond, as Karen does before your eyes. Rowing onward, Stella finds a boat and her first spirit, Gwen, who takes on her true form once on board. Which is the form of an anthropomorphic deer. Why? What were you expecting? Gwen is quick to explain Spiritfarer's core gameplay loop. Spirits have simple wants, warm beds and full bellies. And to cater to those wants, Stella must gather resources like wood, fiber and ore to build homes and grow various foodstuffs to serve tasty meals. Gwen, for example, enjoys a strong cup of coffee and wants a rather bougie log cabin to rest her head at night. Gwen's aristocratic background means she expects a certain quality of afterlife. While Spiritfarer's gameplay loop takes shape, linen fabric is required to upgrade the kitchen. Fabric requires the loom upgrade, so you'll first need to grow and harvest some linen fiber. Upgrade the loom, turn linen fiber into linen fabric, and you can then upgrade the kitchen so you can start making all 78 different meals because they just look delicious. Coinciding with all of that is the game's narrative loop. Happy guests open up to Stella, sharing tales from their past life, their hopes, their regrets, their perspective on death, ultimately relying on Stella's help to find peace and to part through the Everdor. Gwen began smoking at a young age as a rebellious response to her unappreciative father, but the smoking ultimately gave her lung cancer and in the final stages of her disease, 
she traveled back to her parents' manor and considered committing suicide. Stella reached out to her in that moment and helped Gwen accept her fate rather than take her own life. Atul is constantly searching for ways to help out aboard the ship. While other spirits see him fixing cabins and playing the flute, behind closed doors, Atul's guard occasionally drops and his emotions pour out to Stella, who's there to listen when things get too much. Summer worked in farming corporations where frequent contact with unsafe chemicals led her to develop breast cancer. Her sickness prompted embracing a more spiritual side, but even so, Summer needed regular reassurance from Stella to face the looming inevitability of her disease. Spirit stories don't unfold quite as linearly as that, I should mention, because you're free to progress through the different spirit requests in whatever order you choose. Those summaries were also too condensed to really um, get across the, the nuance in each spirit stories and how Stella is there for them as they go through the different stages of, of denial, anger, depression, and acceptance. As I don't have the time to give each spirit justice, I'll focus more on Stella. Certain spirits, like Gwen, Atul, and Summer, are quite plain in their relation to her. But almost every spirit has some connection to Stella. Over time, you realize there exists another version of Stella, and Gwen, and Atul, and Astrid, and Stanley. Other versions of Giovanni, Bruce, and Mickey that existed in another life. You realize that Stella's care is not bound to this boat alone. She was a palliative care nurse, and each spirit is someone she cared for at the end of their life. Their real life, that existed in what I will call the real world, even though it takes place in a video game, and I'm in the real world. Although, I'm in a video, and you're in the real world, so. While the world of Spirit Ferret is a construct, the stories being told, i.e. The, the spirit's character arcs, are abstract reflections of events that happened in the real world. Does that make sense? Returning to Gwen as an example, she is the first spirit you meet and acts as your guide, teaching you the game's mechanics because, in the real world, she was a mentor for Stella, a rare constant in her early life and someone she admired. Alice suffers from dementia and requires a lot of attention on the ship. In the real world, she was the first patient to die in Stella's care, and a turning point in Stella's career, affirmation that this was her true calling, to help people even at their weakest. Stella is each spirit's guiding light, but death casts long shadows. Past mistakes, regrets, doubts, fears, these cannot be absolved with a hot meal and a new porch. Stella is often merely the receptacle for spirits to identify where they went wrong, discuss things they would do differently, and in their waning moments, accept the person they are. <coughs> Gwen, Atul, Summer, Gustav, Astrid, Giovanni, Stanley, Eleanor, Jackie, Beverly, Buck, Bruce and Mickey each has a story to tell and has wisdom to impart. Once Stella successfully navigates their final voyages, she must do some soul searching of her own and confront Hades, god of the underworld. Hades' presence encompasses Spiritfarer. He is the mist surrounding the islands and the edges of the world. Always close, forever inevitable, Hades represents not only death, but Stella's psyche, a mirror reflecting her insecurities. Did she choose this career because she truly wanted to help people, or did it come from fear of death? An attempt to seize control, to know death, in order to conquer that fear. Hades is the clearest notion that Spiritfarer's world lies in the abstract, but why? To best understand this, Stella must talk to her sister, Lily, added in the game's first free update. Although Lily too is with Stella in hospital, her little sister doesn't act like the other spirits. She does not need food or somewhere to rest. She is going over an old photo album of Stella's, revisiting memories of Stella's past. The time spent with Lily and Gwen as they grew up together. The time she met Gustav, the art collector, on holiday in Japan. All the time she was by her patient's side as they deteriorated. Connect these memories and the puzzle finally fits into place. Spiritfarer takes place in Stella's mind on her deathbed. Hospitalized with a fatal illness, Stella's mind returns to those who greatly impacted her life. She helped them to accept death and in turn, she is now ready to do the same. And so with the same poise shown throughout the game, Stella makes her final journey to the Everdor, and thus ends Spiritfarer. 
an emotional ending for sure, but also an unceremonious one, I thought, on first completion. You row to the Everdor, you hug your cat, you burn into a bright light, and the game's over. When stinging goodbyes accompany every spirit's departure, I felt underwhelmed watching Stella go without a word. I didn't expect her to say anything, she is mute the entire game, but without the profound dialogue contained in every other journey to this point, I was left wondering, was she really ready? The real question was whether I was ready. Spiritfarer's ending is merely the final curtain on a game about saying goodbye, about letting go over and over again, knowing that you will eventually make this trip yourself. We all will. And when the boat arrives, you must tackle the great unknown on your own terms. So let's unpack this thing we call death, shall we? Ask developer Thunder Lotus what Spiritfarer is about and they'll tell you it's a cozy game about dying. They're right. Spiritfarer is a game about dying, but it's not literally about dying. It wouldn't look this pretty if it was. For starters, it would look like, I don't know, a bunch of levels with similar design, each one seemingly shorter than the next, but all you can think about is how good those earlier levels were, and how daunting the future levels sound, and you never really focus on the level you're playing right now. Maybe it's a multiplayer, maybe it's not. Maybe it's filled with a f ton of bugs. Ultimately, it doesn't matter, and the game's over, and your screen goes black for eternity. <laughs> Been a rough couple months. No one wants to play that game. We're already playing it, and there are no continues, no save points, but we're stuck on the hardest difficulty, and for some reason, we decided to put skulls on. If Spiritfarer is a game about dying, why does it feel nice to play? I'm not saying the tagline is wrong, it is a game about dying, and that definitely sounds more interesting than a game about loss. Like, that could be a game about not being able to find your car keys. Specifically, Spiritfarer concerns dealing with loss, and the comfort and the support needed to get through tough times. It's a resonant theme that's expressed through every inch of the game. Design, art style, characters, plot, and perhaps most of all, mechanics. The art design is the most visible. Watercolour backdrops are filled with soft pastel hues inspired by the paintings of Hiroshi Yoshida, preventing the game from feeling heavy despite dealing with such heavy themes. The gameplay does the same in two key ways. One, there's great satisfaction found in the busybody task management that takes up the majority of the game. It's the structure needed to get back on your feet when all else feels hopeless. A series of small incremental steps that encourage a feeling of accomplishment without the threat of failure. And two, the possibility of failure doesn't exist, because the gameplay cradles you. If you mess up the timing while mining ores, the game is just like, oh, you broke your pickaxe? Well, don't worry, it's, it's a magical pickaxe anyway, so just try again. And Stella makes a little face, and you're like, well, this is just lovely. Similarly, platforming elements are fun, but never test you. It's a key component of many life and farm simulation games, like how you can spend a whole week in Stardew Valley and just grow five tomatoes, and that's it. You, you don't even sell them, you just give them to your neighbours as a gift. And they're like, oh, this is so nice, thanks so much. And that's it. There's comfort to that because there's no looming sense of reality like, well, you should sell those tomatoes so you have enough money to live, you know? Do you really want to rent this little farm hut forever? Don't you want to save for a down payment on a farm hut of your own, you know? Shouldn't you have a mortgage at your age? And if you spent your leftover cash on more tomato seeds, you can make more money and use it to buy sprinklers. And with the power of automation, you'll have more free time to care for your chickens so they'll lay more eggs and you can sell those. And then you can afford a horse because, well, don't you want to get around a bit quicker? There are only so many hours in the day and you're not getting any younger. And it's like, okay, but you know, I kind of like my little tomato patch. Is that such a crime? No, it's not. Not in Stardew Valley. Growing your farm is an option, and a fun option too, I should say, because it means you sample more of the game, but it's not expected of you. Not only are we expected in the real world to earn as much as possible to give our future the best shot at succeeding, which I'm quickly learning is a long shot at best, but playing more of real life usually means working an extra job, or working overtime, or saving money, which last time I checked, weren't all that fun. Anyway, <laughs> that was a major digression. What I was trying to say with all that is the gentle spiraling staircase of progression wraps around Spiritfarer like a warm hug. Most new buildings come as the result of completing a certain spirit's request, starting with Gwen, who gives you the loom and teaches you how to make thread. 
Atoll teaches you how to turn wood into planks. Gustav shows you how to smelt things. While the progress is satisfying mechanically, from fiber to thread to fabric, from ore to ingot to metal, each spirit imparts on you their knowledge and offers you something to remember them by. There's a reason I subconsciously placed the sawmill next to Atoll's workshop and the loom beside Gwen's cabin. It's how I remember them once they're gone. Some players may feel deterred by Spiritfarer's prolonged gameplay loops, especially when the narrative is tied to them. Occasionally, the dialogue doesn't help itself here, which is tied to the only real gripe I have with this game. Non-core spirit interactions range from humorous to tedious, especially those that don't go anywhere. They are all optional, but some of these NPCs have side quests, so you do kind of need to talk to everyone if you're the completionist type. A lot of the time, it's not so much the words themselves, but how only one sentence will ever show on screen, which I can tell is to squeeze some extra personality out of text-based interactions, which I appreciate because this is exactly the same way I text, sending like seven messages instead of one, but it just leaves you mashing the X button to finish a conversation that doesn't lead to anything. The two counters to this are I only really experienced that the second time I was playing the game, and this isn't the case for any of the, the core spirits that are on board the ship. Investing in the lives of those on board still takes time. I mean, I have sunk a lot of hours into this game. The positive is that it creates a deeper emotional payoff, but some people may lose interest before getting there. However short or long your time with Spiritfarer is though, its warm and fuzzy aura is quick to envelop you. Spiritfarer doesn't just feel nice to play. If that was the aim, why approach such heavy themes in the first place? Through its mechanics, it becomes much more than that. A support system, a balance between the harsh reality of death and the power of empathy pinpointed on the single biggest question mark in all our lives. Spirit we all deal with death. We all lose people we care about, and each time there is pain, of course, but there is also catharsis from the togetherness that follows. I get the feeling I sound like a cheap fortune cookie at the moment, but... You're just gonna have to deal with it. It's, it's how I write. Through this routine of ferrying spirits to the afterlife, preparing them for the great journey beyond, the player is ready to support Stella when it's her time to do the same. Playing Spiritfarer resonated with me on a very personal and emotional level. It's not just some words on the philosophy of impermanence or the importance of compassion. Those lessons exist, but it's more a series of small goodbyes to the people you care about. That's not a game about dying, it's a game about life as exaggerated as that may sound. When the walls of darkness close in, directing your focus onto something, anything, can go a long way. Games are a good way to do that, and games like Spiritfarer might heal you, even just the smallest amount, in the process. We don't say goodbye, but you can give your friend a hug, and you'll see them real soon, okay? I'm sure there are films that pair distressing emotional themes with calm and comforting visuals, I just can't think of any right now. Spiritfarer though definitely takes that juxtaposition a step further by involving you in its world, with friendly pats on the back that urge you to keep going while twinges of sadness and loss quite literally stack up behind you. Thunder Lotus chose to discuss the topic of death and used personal experiences from the team to shape its characters, and that lends a huge amount of authenticity, which is integral to connecting the player to the story, but the best thing about this game's theme, for me, is how it's opened up a conversation on a subject that is not discussed in video games, and discussed it in a very mature way. As I said at the top of this video, death is everywhere in games, but it lies at the other end of the spectrum, which makes Spiritfarer even further from the norm. This game tackles not only the reality of death, a reality we all experience, but the long and arduous journey of grief and the difficulty of traversing it alone. From a single player game, that's hugely impressive, and I hope it can be a tool to deal with loss for anyone that needs it. It certainly helped me, and I hope and I believe that Spiritfarer becomes a benchmark for progressing how we approach such themes in the future. I said almost every spirit met Stella in the real world, and that's because one doesn't. Buck was Lily's close friend, and Stella only knows him through stories told by her sister, who would fondly recall Buck's love for escapism through tabletop RPGs, an escapism that's all the more appealing when faced with a fatal illness. Buck's affinity for role-playing games got Stella into them herself, and he lives on through her. I feel like that's a beautiful microcosm of Spiritfarer. Real stories, real human emotions, contained in a fictional world within a video game that has the potential to reach millions of people. 
I think it's also an endorsement to pursue the things in life that invigorate you, because they can be passed on to others even when you're no longer there. It's an energy that transcends time and space. <laughs> Gone from sounding like a fortune cookie to sounding like I'm high as f <laughs> Learning to say goodbye is learning how to celebrate the life of those closest to us. To remember their impact and to accept that those times have passed. What remains? Well, right now, there is you. Take the lessons that others have taught you into your own life so that they may live on through you. Maybe that's what lies on the other side of the Everdor. Every beautiful memory, every sadness, every lesson, seen through the eyes of those that remember you and manifested into all the good they do in the world. Thank you.